Well, how about you? Are you ready for a day of harvest? Are you ready to reap all that you've sown? I don't know about you, but maybe if you've been on a uh, agricultural community or part of a farm where harvest day comes around and people are very excited about bringing in the harvest, collecting, bringing in all the things that they have sown and have grown throughout the summer season and now the fall day of harvest being that which is a day of great reaping, pulling in together. Well, today is your personal day of harvest. That's right. We get to celebrate in a new way this understanding of a harvest that's available to each and every one of us. It's Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday was a celebration of a harvest, a celebration of a wonderful blessing, a feast of harvesting that was uh, there in the Jewish tradition. And it was there that it was a time to remember in this harvest what all they've gleaned, what all they've gained, to remember their deliverance from Egypt. How important it was for each and everyone to stop and have a moment of remembrance. You know, sometimes in the days of our life, we get so busy, we get carried up with all kinds of activities, we simply forget. We don't take time to really remember key moments in our life. How many of you can remember your wedding anniversary, huh? Some of you can, and some of you cannot. Some of you say, well, wait a minute, I need to think about that, or how about the day you graduated from high school or college, or some key moment in your life. You keep forgetting, well, wait, I'm not sure. Was that, you know, 19... Uh, 98 or 96, well, okay, for some of us, 1978 or 76 or, well, some of us, 1968 or, okay, we'll stop with that. But we realize for us, sometimes we need to have a moment to reflect, to remember a key moment in our lives. And so this great feast was there, a feast to remember the deliverance, this key moment in Jewish culture, Jewish history. A key moment for each and every Jew to think about being liberated, set free from any kind of bondage within their lives. Well, today, as metaphysical seekers, we too want to have this moment of remembrance of a deliverance. That's right. You've been delivered. There is a deliverance available to you. Deliverance from ignorance. That's right. For infinite wisdom, infinite understanding, infinite insight, The spiritual enrichment for our day-to-day journey is available for us to celebrate and to have a celebration of a harvest of blessings being brought in, reaping the goodness of understanding that we no longer have to live in ignorance. Ignorance to what, you might say? We're celebrating the very truth that we don't have to live in ignorance from of fear, separation, lack. You see, our world so often wants to reinforce these things. You're so separated and removed from God. God up there in the sky. God far away from you, this ideas. Or that you need to live in fear that is constantly replicated in our spiritual traditions today. You need to be afraid. Jesus is coming and you may be left behind. You need to be afraid. You may burn in hell. You may be afraid that you're not pleased God in an appropriate way, that God's going to punish you or God's going to in some way cause some suffering in your life. Fear propagated over and over again. And how about those feelings of lack and limitation, that somehow as a child of God, we're meant to suffer or that we're in poor poverty and we're lacking the blessings and the goodness and the abundance that Jesus spoke about. Thank you, God, for this wonderful insight, wisdom, understanding. Thank you, God, for truth that sets us free and liberates us from this kind of ignorance. An ignorance that's held us in bondage, held us captive for so long, we are liberated and set free from it. When we begin to understand, God will never leave us nor forsake us. There is no moment when you are uh, uh, left behind. There's no moment that you need to live in fear. There's no moment that you need to be afraid that God's going to somehow bestow some sort of punishment on you, for God is love. Have we not somehow forgotten that? And we think God is to be feared. God is to be questioned in the sense of that it would be... uh, frightened at any moment that God may bestow some sort of punishment on our lives. You are free. Do you get this? You are free. And the beautiful thing about this is you don't have to uh, live in this uh, separation. You don't have to live in this lack. You don't have to live in this fear. You don't have to. Wait a minute. We don't have to? And for so many of us, we grew up in spiritual teachings that said, yeah, 
You have to live in fear. You have to believe you're unworthy. You have to, as a good person of God, a follower of God, you have to live in this sense of you're limited, you're unworthy, there's lack in your life, and you are not that able to celebrate the fullness of God's blessing because you're so unworthy. You see, we don't have to. We can be expressing our liberation, our freedom, and we are set free from this kind of ignorance that has been holding us back for years in some sort of idea that we are not blessed of God. We don't have to do these kind of things. And when we're awakened to this true spirituality, we realize something amazing happens in our life, something wonderful. For this level of awareness that comes to you, I'm fully aware. I get it. I'm conscious. I am free. Free from the bondage of all these things. Wow, it transforms our life. There's an incredible experience that happens with this when we realize I don't have to live each day from this perspective. But I'm set free. I'm set free now to welcome in my thinking and to my consciousness, into my full awareness that the presence of God is with me. And that power and presence is flowing in me and through me. That power and presence has filled me from head to toe. And I need not walk in fear. I walk in a holy boldness. I need not walk in a sense of lack. I walk in abundance. I need not walk in some sort of feeling that I'm separate from God in any way. Because God, that power and presence is deep within me. How many of you are ready to claim the kingdom of heaven is within you? The very words of Jesus, the very teaching. You know, there's a lot of people like, wait, wait, wait. Jesus may have said that, but he certainly didn't mean that. Honestly, that's quite a few people's Christianity. He didn't really mean that God dwells within us 24-7 at all times. Maybe that God comes to our lives when we've wept and pleaded and begged enough, but that's not true at all. There's no separation. There's nothing to be feared for that divine presence of love is within us, and that divine presence is ever unfolding abundance for us, blessing. You can claim, I am blessed when I wake up in the morning till I lay my head to rest. I am blessed. Because you've been liberated with this wonderful truth. You claim and live it out each and every day. That that sweet, sweet spirit, that presence of God is in you, through you, around you, and for you at all times. And that presence is substance. That's right. That presence is substance. What? That a presence or this awareness is the substance that things are made of. And where are we hearing that? Faith. Faith. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We find in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. So when we are welcoming this presence and celebrating our liberation from the ignorance that somehow we may think we are called or have to live a life of fear, lack, or separation, we welcome this presence, which is a substance within us. That's right, a substance within us. It is a presence. It is the substance of things hoped for. That's right. That divine presence in God filling your life is that energy, the substance that is faith at work within you. What is faith? But faith is that wonderful presence of God and the knowing that that presence of God is with you, never leaving you nor forsaking you. It's there at all times. Now, here we find in Pentecost the story of the Disciples gathering together in an upper room. We find it in Acts chapter 1, verses chapters 1 and 2, the very unfolding of the movement of Pentecost and its birth of the Christian church, shall we say, in its tradition. But it has a powerful meaning for us. For we find that as they gathered together in this upper room, they came together, and the Scripture says, and when they're all together in one place, meaning when they were all together in one accord, when they all come together in a sense of unity and oneness, how is it that we come to that place of unity and oneness? Well, we realize God in us. And the God in me is the God in you. And there is no separation. That you are the divine. You are the divine. You are the divine. I am the divine. We're all the expression of the divine. And that brings us into the sense of being one accord with one another being in complete unity with one another. And when they're all together, that means that there is a sense, shall we say, a concentration of thought 
of the activities of the mind that are all coming together, that there was this wonderful sense of, that's, I love this word, concentration. That's right. Concentration. How many of you watch concentration on television? You know? And what do you need to do? Yeah, you all know that. Okay. You remember the game show. What did you have to do? You had to focus, concentrate, didn't you? You had to be attentive. We were watching concentration on uh, one of these uh, decade television shows, a uh, concentration show from 30 years ago, and the young man would say, I don't know what's wrong with me today. I don't have my focus. I'm not able to concentrate. I can't remember where, you know, number 13 matched with number 27 or whatever it may be. And he couldn't remember all these things because he didn't concentrate. He was having ability, inability to focus, to remember. So it is when we come to this point where we are concentrating our thoughts in a sense of remembrance. I know who I am. I know what I am. I know I'm the revelation of God. I know I'm the divine expression of God right now. I'm concentrating and I'm not allowing anything else to be a distraction in my life. For this is the great instruction for us. And I would love it if we all could memorize this. There's a beautiful passage of Scripture that says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Let this thinking, let this understanding, let this enlightenment, let this wonderful truth, let this consciousness, let this awareness that Jesus had be in you. That's right. This is the secret to our great success is when we begin to awaken the liberation that Jesus gave us to saying, I've been teaching, I've been talking about this, I've been showing you, I've been the example for you. You are invited to have this very same thinking, this very same knowledge, this very same understanding in your life, and to live that out, to live that out in such a liberation that you need not live in ignorance, but you live in the wonderful understanding and knowing. I let, I allow my mind to be in the same thinking, the same teaching that Jesus had. And what did Jesus say over and over again? I and the Father are one. So what kind of thinking do we want to have? Every day we wake up and go, I and the divine source are one. God is in me. And God, I'm releasing out. God, I am expressing. And today, my words, my actions, my deeds are going to reveal the power and presence of God to everyone that I come in contact with. I and this divine source called God, I and the Father are one. Not two, but one. So when you see me, you see the Father, Jesus said. That's the same mind that we're called to have. That when you see me, you see the revelation of God. You see God in me and through me. And when we begin to take on this understanding, and this is our day-to-day -day consciousness, our concentration, our thinking, that every single moment of the life that we are walking as a revelation of the God, of the divine, how powerful this is. I and this divine source are one. This then becomes a mind that is so focused that you can't be distracted. Oh, but how many of us say, I get distracted a lot, you know? I watch the news, and I forgot God is in me. I watch the television show on crime and all the famine in this world, and you know what? I got distracted. And I got caught up in thinking this way, and I forgot, wait a minute, I and the, the divine source are one. The Father is within me. There's no separation. And yet I was, fear began to creep in. I watched these stories of the news on the economy, and I began to think, oh, we're not going to make it. It's struggling, and it's difficult, and the finances are going to be difficult, and I thought we're going to be living in lack, and I got distracted. And how about many of some of you would say, you know what, I began to watch all this stuff going on, and fear crept into me, and I just feel in so many ways the limitations of what we can accomplish in this world. You see, what happens is when your mind is the mind of Christ, there is no distraction because it is focused and there's concentration and it's single. All right? That's right. Let's look at a passage of Scripture. Matthew 6, 22 says, If your eye be single, notice it didn't say your eyes, is it saying one eye should be single and the other? No, it's not talking about your physical eye. It's talking about the spiritual eye. The spiritual eye was that of centered within of your consciousness because that's truly how you see things. 
You may think you see things with your eyes, but you don't. You see things with that which you perceive it to be. You know, you perceive it to be so. It may not really be so, but you perceive it to be so. You see, that's what the eyes are doing. But with the wonderful spiritual consciousness, you begin to know and look beyond the physical. It's kind of like you go to the grocery store and you see these wonderful fruit displays and you perceive these shiny apples to be so delicious because, well, they've got a little wax on them and they've been polished up a little bit. But maybe you take a bite and go, ooh, that wasn't that tasty. But my perception was it would be really delicious. But I perceived through my eyes that it was. But, oh, how about our spiritual seeing, which looks beyond the physical, looks beyond. And that's what this passage from Matthew is speaking about. It says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where the things that you value the most are, that's where your heart will be. What do you value the most? Do you value the insight, the wisdom, the divine presence of God? When you do value that immensely, that's where your heart is. And then it goes on to talk very clearly for us about that the body, the light of the body is the eye. And how important that we understand that. And that therefore, if your eye, your thinking, your consciousness, that which you see spiritually with, is focused, if your eye be single, not divided, not going two different ways, but focused, you might say, really streamlined, concentration, your whole body will then be filled with light. What is light? Wisdom, insight, understanding. It's going to happen to you. When you begin to say, I begin to claim these divine promises of God, I begin to walk and live with the very mind of Jesus, that consciousness, that one who is my way shower, unfolding me and teaching me uh, this very wisdom of God. I welcome that thinking, that awareness within my life. And I'm so focused. My mind, my eye is single. What will happen then? But if your eye then be divided or in a sense of duality of constantly looking this way and that way, I can, I can't, it's possible, it's not possible. You see how we were then torn? We are then in what we call wavering faith. We're fluctuating back and forth. You see? The scripture then says, uh, if thy eye be divided or be uh, with evil, that is that error thinking, the whole body is then going to be full of this darkness. But when you begin to think and focus and your eye be single, that spiritual thought eye, that is consciousness, be very focused in the very mind of Christ, you are filled with light. You're filled with insight. You're filled with wisdom. You're filled with understanding. It's just going to flow within you. That is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God in you, filling you, flooding your life with all that you may need to know in the appropriate times. Now it goes on to say, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other. And this is where we're constantly serving two masters of saying, you know, I'm distracted. Oh, I believe, and then I'm distracted. I don't believe. I want to, but I'm distracted. I can't. Uh, You know, we've got all these distractions coming up in our world because we're not single-minded, single eye, focused, living in a spiritual realm of concentration at times within our lives. If the eye be single means that we're not looking to the left or to the right, but we're focused. And where do we see this beautifully illustrated for us? Ah, Peter invited to get out of the boat. Jesus comes walking on the water, invites Peter to step out of the boat. And you know what? Peter doesn't look to the left or the right. He doesn't say that. He's like, well, wait a minute. How do I walk? He just gets out of the boat. He gets out of the boat with great faith and belief that he can do this. His eye is single. He's focused. He's thinking, I can do this because I've been invited to do so. I've been called out to do so. And I know that if the Christ is doing it and the same mind is in me, I am doing it as well. Mm, Then something happened. A distraction comes into his life. And what happened? He lost that consistent, concentrated faith, shall we say. 
mind began distracted and he begins to sink into the waters, right? And that's you and I. Every single day we wake up in the morning, I've got the mind of Christ. I am ready to move out in this world. I am thinking as Jesus thinks. I'm speaking as Jesus spoke. I am revealing God. The Father and I are one. And then, woo, something hits. And we lose distraction. And we too sink into the chaos of this world. And the waters seem to catch us and we feel like sometimes we're drowning. The beauty is that same mind of Christ is calling for us and pulling us back up. And getting us back, lifting us back up. Wait a minute. I'm learning. I can't be distracted. I won't be distracted. I will be focused. I'm going to claim this. If my eye be single, if my mind and my thought process be single, I can move above the chaotic waters. And I can walk across the waves of this world that may want to capture me, drown me, cause me to sink into sorrows and all kinds of challenges within our lives. So today we're coming together like the early church, gathering together on the day of Pentecost, a day of remembrance, to remember this wonderful liberation that we have, that we are liberated and that we are free. Oh, but we have forgotten. You know, have you ever seen uh, uh, maybe an animal that's been placed in the cage and it's been caged for so long, it begins to believe it can only be in that cage? And then the door is open. And the animal doesn't quite realize the door is open, but remains in the cage. Yeah. I had a parakeet years ago when I was a little boy. And I loved that parakeet. And on the day when it came to clean the bird's cage, the bird was so accustomed to be caged that even though I opened up the door, it didn't know it could fly out and be free. It didn't know it had a liberating moment. It didn't know that they were that it was... Uh, set free from the bondage of the doors of the cage or the bars of the cage. And this is our problem in our spiritual life. We've forgotten. The door is open. You don't have to live in the bondage of fear. You don't have to live in the cage of limitation. You don't have to dwell and stay in this place of separation feelings from God and somehow an unworthiness within your life. So let's get it together. Let's get our thoughts all in one chord. Let's move into this sense of oneness like these early disciples did. And suddenly with this sort of spiritual concentration that I've spoken of, this spiritual focus of the whole mind coming together and thinking in harmony with God's very promises, thinking in harmony with the very teaching of Jesus, What happens is that we then move out in an incredible holy boldness that comes to our lives. There is something that happens to our thinking, our very mind, when we begin to liberate it from all of the chains and bondages of spiritual uh, teachings, maybe of our past beliefs, things like that that hold us back. So what happens is when we celebrate this liberation, what happens? We move out into a day of Pentecost, a day of harvest. That's right. We get to glean all the goodness of liberated thinking, all the goodness of being set free from ignorant thoughts. We get all the goodness of knowing that we walk in God's blessings at all times. And what happened for these early believers gathering in this upper room, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled. The illustration here is of being filled might be or immersed in the Holy Spirit. To be immersed, that is to be doused, to be soaked, to be drenched, to be saturated in this divine presence of God. It's not a little dribble. It's not a little dabble. It's not a little splash. It's not a sprinkle. It's an immersion. And that's what we want to be every day, immersed into this consciousness, immersed into this thinking immersed deep, deep within. Shall we say baptized in new thought? Baptized in new thinking. Baptized with a single eye. Immersed so deep. I don't know about you, but I grew up as a preacher's kid. And baptism was a big part. And they would have all these wonderful moments. Shall we gather at the river? And we'd go down to the river with the congregants and they could be baptized. And a baptism moment wasn't any little sprinkling or splatter. Mm -mm, Not in our church. That was an immersion. 
You know, that's where the pastor gets you to hold on to your nose. Come on, grab on tight, and I'm going to immerse you into the water. We're going to go deep, deep down until every part of you is in that water. And the pastor may even hold you down until you promise to tithe, and then lift you back up. Uh huh. Yes, that was immersion. Now, that's baptism, you know. No little dibble, no little drip. No, no, oh, no, we got to get you. And if they didn't get all the way down, well, we're going down again. Uh huh, we're going down again because we want you immersed. We want you to be filled with this wonderful awareness. Well, that's what the Spirit of God is all about for us today, that we want to be immersed in this divine presence of God in such a wonderful way that the Holy Spirit, this spirit of wholeness, which is holy, spirit of completeness comes across our lives and fills us to overflowing, that we suddenly move out in a state of now knowing, not in ignorance, but knowing who we are, knowing and understanding our truth. This has then got to be times of prayer and meditation that just awaken us to all that God has for us. You know, some people say, well, you know, I go to prayer and meditation, I fall asleep. But really, prayer and meditation is really the greatest awakening of your spiritual life. Not a time to slumber. Yes, in the stillness and the quiet, your physical body may quiet down. It may have the tendency to be at just perfect rest. But oh, the soul is immersed in this wonderful presence of love of the divine, in prayer and the centeredness in meditation that allows us then for spiritual energies to rise up within our life, this wonderful awareness of God within us that enables us to just be set free and live boldly in that freedom. Because this is what happens when you're in that immersion experience so deep down in the very presence of God. What happens within us, there's a new confidence that comes to you. Some of us may be easily distracted. Some of us may lose our focus. Some of us may be not in a single mind, not focused enough with concentration on the goodness of God. Oh, but when you're immersed, when you're deeply immersed in that divine presence, there comes a new sense of confidence and assurance because you're filled with the substance, as I mentioned earlier, the substance of all that is created, uh, created in this world. That substance is the presence of God. And we use that presence. We speak that presence. We live that presence. We unfold that presence. And that substance is what all the wonderful manifestations of our world are made of because we're confident. We know that we know that we know. The divine presence is in us. We've been immersed. We don't walk in fear. We don't walk in limitation. We walk in holy boldness. And what do we see about the early church from the story of Acts chapters 1 and 2? But that they moved out. Those disciples had gathered in this upper room and they'd all come into one accord, into one thinking. They'd all come into a sense of harmony and a sense of unity in such a beautiful way. Well, you can imagine. Let's just take a moment to visit that upper room. Who's in that upper room? Disciples who denied Jesus. You denied Jesus? You betrayed? Peter, you're here? Didn't you deny Jesus three times before the, the rooster crowed? And Mary, where were you guys? Uh-huh, Mary, the mother of Jesus. I was there at the cross, and you all ran off and hiding and running away. You can imagine the immense feelings, attitudes, emotions, when they all came together in that upper room? What are you doing here? What are you doing there? You, judgment, condemnation, you can imagine it all there. As they went to prayer, immersed in the Spirit of God, immersed in the presence, you know what happens? All that division went away. All that judgment went away. All that condemnation melted away because they came into a sense of unity, harmony, oneness, one accord. This is what happens to us. And when our world, we're so divided and we're split up and we're pulled in different ways and we're so polarized, what happens when we all get immersed in the presence of God? There is unity and harmony because we realize the love of God unites us. There's a wonderful presence that builds us and pulls us together. There's a change in our thinking when we're immersed in this beautiful presence. 
We just allow this divine presence to permeate our lives fully. There is a confidence. There's assurance. There's a holy boldness that comes to us. Now that early group of disciples moved out and began to speak and testify, began to tell others of the goodness of God. And with that wonderful power, people of many different backgrounds and diversities came together. Wow. It speaks of the early church being extremely diverse and welcoming everyone. What a harvest. What a day of reaping. When ignorance that has separated us is suddenly removed, when ignorance that has separated us from the divine presence is suddenly removed, when fear of one another is suddenly removed, and when fear of God is suddenly removed, when the fear and limitation and lack of this world is suddenly removed, and we realize that we all live in a world of abundance. That's right, because the abundance of God is ready to unfold for us at any time. When we know that we're free, liberated, from any of this kind of thinking of lack, fear, and separation. So I'm inviting you today to celebrate Pentecost in your own individual way, and that is to celebrate a liberation from ignorance, to celebrate a wonderful harvest time that is here for you to reap in all the goodness that God has for you because it's available. You don't have to live in fear. You don't have to live in separation. You don't have to live in bondage. You don't have to, but the beauty of God is there to take you to a wonderful place of immersed in this presence. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Amen.